Professor Roger Zuckies is really a top um, physiologist and prebiologist. And uh, he's been working um, as a professor of agroecology and sustainable development school of tropical biology at James Cook University in Australia. And he has been um, also the director, former director of the of research in International Center for Research in Agroforestry, and he has been a lot of work in forestry and agroforestry. He has been uh, written 300 scientific publications, and he has his recent book. Um, called Living with the Trees of Life Towards the Transformation of Tropical Agriculture. So without further ado, I'm sure you're really interested to hear. The title of his presentation will be Living with the Trees of Life, Addressing Poverty, Malnutrition, Hunger, and Environmental Degradation. Okay. Thank you very much. Good. Well, thank you all for coming. It's uh, very good to see so many people here. Um, so as Grace has said, the, I'm going to be talking about living with the trees of life. I chose that title for the book because it's partly that I work to help people in the tropics to live with the trees of life, and partly that I personally have to live with the trees of life. So it's a sort of joint reason for, for using that title for the book. Um, and I'm going to be looking at how we can use these, uh, particularly the indigenous fruits and nuts, uh, with experience from West Africa and from the Pacific, particularly, uh, to improve the livelihoods of people and do that in ways which perhaps also help to um, support environmental rehabilitation, uh, food security, etc. So let's just remind ourselves first of all of what the big problems are. Despite the uh, great success of the Green Revolution, which was aimed at also addressing some of these big issues, uh, you can see that we still have billions of people suffering uh, from poverty, malnutrition and hunger. Very often the same people suffering from all three things. Uh, and we also have serious environmental degradation uh, affecting up to 38% of agricultural land. So um, I think we need still need to be looking to see how to find better ways of um, developing agriculture in the tropics and subtropics particularly. And on thinking about that, it seems to me that all of these issues are actually integrated and interactive, uh, and we need just to try to get our heads around the complexity of the problem. So this nasty diagram, uh, is trying to say that I think the sort of driving point for this is, is the desire for security and wealth. And that causes people, uh, when they're under particular circumstances, to uh, use soils and water unsustainably to, to practice deforestation, overgrazing, and other forms of overuse, fishing obviously for, for the oceans as well. Um, and that kind of overuse basically causes ecosystem degradation, and on land, of course, that enhances soil erosion. That kind of degradation then goes on to cause loss of biodiversity, breakdown of ecosystem function, and the, the, the result of that, and the thing, I guess, of, of most importance to agriculture, is this loss of crop yield. And that then, in, in turn, leads to hunger and malnutrition, declining livelihoods, uh, uh, and then that feeds right back up to uh, driving the whole cycle again. So we have a cyclical process generally spiraling downwards. Uh, and then in the fringes of that, we have loss of income, we have susceptible di to disease, we have um, loss of soil fertility, need perhaps to use agrochemicals, pollution, and health risks. Uh, and I think if we can try to absorb that question and that, that series of problems, then maybe we can find uh, a way out. Or, but it's obviously not going to be uh, that easy. I don't know how many of you know this book by uh, Julian Cribb, that just came out a year or so ago, uh, The Coming Famine, and he sums up the, the challenge facing the world um, that 
1.8 billion people who grow food, their challenge is to double their output of food using less water, less land, less energy, and less fertilizer. And they do that against a whole set of other constraints. So we do have this huge problem, um, how to feed the world and how to do that more sustainably. And when, we, when you see things in the press uh, about that, we tend to hear a very polarized view of the world. At one end of the scale is the suggestion that GMOs and biotechnology can solve all these issues. Uh, and at the other end of the scale, we hear that the really important thing is, is organic approaches and, and less use of less fertilizers and less uh, pesticides. Uh, and it seems that these two sides can't really talk to each other, uh, and we have this, um, this polarized vision of, of the future, and that seems to me to cause a, a lot of our problems, because when we look to the industrialized countries of the world, what we see is, in fact, that most farmers spread right across that range, uh, and that seems, in many ways, perhaps to be a, a more sensible way to go. However, if we look to the tropics, and particularly the tropics and subtropics, there we find that, um, okay, there's a little bit of biotechnology often done in um, uh, large uh, plantation companies, but the vast majority of the farmers are organic by default, simply because they can't afford fertilizers. Uh, they're poor farmers living on just a few dollars a day. Uh, and uh, very much at the uh, edge of the cash economy. Uh, and then the, some farmers uh, are also going to grow cash crops, things like tea, cocoa, coffee, etc. Uh, and they manage to push themselves a little bit further up this, um, up this uh, axis. But perhaps the real issue is that when we compare the temperate zone industrialized countries with the tropics, you can see we have a very different set of issues. So in, in the industrialized countries, we have probably less than 3% of the population engaged in large-scale mechanized agriculture. The other 97% generating income in, in other ways, or as increasingly seems to happen these days, some of them are on, on social support. But we have young fertile soils, we have reasonably high organic matter, and we have very, uh, relatively low uh, biodiversity, whereas in the tropics we have a completely different situation of about 80% of the population engaged in smallholder agriculture, uh, so that leaving 20% uh, doing other things. Uh, many of these people are living right on the, the edge, the brim of the cash economy, and with absolutely no social support. Uh, here we have more fairly exhausted, old soils, relatively low in organic matter, but we have high biodiversity. So it seems to me the, to think that the, the way forward, the solution, is going to be the same in these two sets of countries probably um, doesn't make a great deal of sense. And maybe we need to be thinking a bit more, a bit differently about how to go forward. Now, the knee-jerk reaction, I think, of, of many academics uh, and many policymakers uh, in thinking about the tropics is, well, let, if, if yield is the problem, obviously we need to do more crop improvement and increase the potential of the crop a bit more. But in fact, it seems to me that the much more important thing to do is to look at addressing this huge yield gap. That's the difference between the biological yield potential, the green line, <laughs> Uh, and what farmers in the field actually achieve on their rather degraded soil. And if we could fill this yield gap, then much of our food uh, problem would go away, and maybe we can see, as we'll see later, maybe some other uh, the interacting things can also be reduced uh, in, in parallel with that. So this may be an appropriate solution uh, in the industrialized world where the yield gap is much reduced, um, but I think for the tropics we perhaps need to be thinking much more about filling the yield gap. So 
how could we how could we do that? And I, I guess the question that I'm going to be addressing is uh, can trees and agroforestry help us uh, in this direction? And so I'm going to be proposing to you um, a three-step solution to filling the yield gap. The first step is to use nitrogen fixing trees and shrubs uh, to restore soil fertility from the kind of condition that you see here with severe nitrogen deficiency, uh, very poor yields, usually sort of around one ton per hectare in a maize crop here in, in southern Africa, um, and use either an improved uh, fallow like this one, in this case it's Caliandra being used as a two-year improved fallow, or over here on the, on the right, uh, Cespania being used in relay cropping, that's where the, the, the Cespania is grown at the same time as the maize, so that you don't lose uh, production. And in both these systems, a two-year uh, use of these leguminous trees or shrubs can, can get you from here to here, up from, up to, from about one ton up to about four or five tons. If you remember back to the graph, the deep with full potential yield is up near eight, uh, eight to ten tons. So we can only get halfway, uh, I think, with this approach, usually because potassium and phosphate and other minerals uh, are, are also limiting and we can't get those uh, from, from trees. So this is step one. To be able to buy the fertilizers and the other inputs that would perhaps get us up to the full potential yield, we need to generate income. And so, uh, getting on now for, for 20 years ago, we started to think about how um, farmers in the tropics could generate uh, income from things that they already had, but which perhaps they just needed to improve. And so, we talked to farmers uh, in their villages and, and said, what would you really like to grow if you had the choice of growing anything you wanted? Um, and they were a bit surprised to be asked a question like that because, as they said, white people normally come and tell us what we should do. But um, we all were asking them and they, once they understood that we were asking them and really, really wanted to know what they wanted to do, they said, well, we want to grow our indigenous fruits, nuts, and medicinal plants the things that we used to gather from the forest when we had forest, but that forest is disappearing, getting further and further away. Uh, and so that resource is no longer available to us. It's important in our tradition and culture. It's important uh, to our local markets. Uh, and we don't want to eat maize every day of the week. So we, from that, developed uh, a list of priority species based on what the farmers were telling us. Uh, in a participatory process, uh, and that list usually went to 50 or so species for any one site that we went to, uh, and then decided that perhaps the way we could best help them was to teach them uh, and, and help them to learn the basic skills and techniques of, of simple horticulture, how to develop a, a nursery, a tree nursery, how to propagate plants vegetatively, and so how to produce cultivars. So the, in this case, in uh, humid West Africa, the top five species that were chosen in the end uh, were the bush mango, Edinga gabonensis, uh, safu, Dacioides endivis, or African plum, uh, Lucinodendron, which is a, a, a spice tree, um, Garcinia cola, which again is used as the nut is used as a, as a, a chewing, uh, and a fruit that was more popular particularly in Nigeria. So those were selected as the first five species uh, and subsequently that list has grown enormously as the farmers are getting more experience and doing their own thing. So the concept then was how do we practice straightforward, long, well-known techniques of, of horticulture uh, and use them to domesticate um, these trees uh, in ways that are going to help local people. And so the, whole, the concept of domestication is not that different from how it's applied elsewhere, but basically we break it down to these three steps. We need to identify the resource and to decide 
which species were irrelevant and to characterize that resource based on the knowledge of, of local people, based on the markets, uh, and based on the economic potential. Having chosen some species then to see how to capture, select, and manage those genetic resources, again needing to do that in, in, with uh, in, in, this, um, in the relationships between farmers' preferences and, and the market, use simple uh, tree biology uh, and horticulture to multiply selected individuals to, to involve and start breeding programs uh, and to develop the techniques to capture genetic variability. And then having got those uh, cultivars, how do you then integrate those into the farming system uh, to regenerate and, and make more sustainable land use systems and um, from there obviously the need to assess the adoption and impact both socioeconomic uh, and environmental. So in my book at least um, domestication is a fairly broad <coughs> wide-ranging uh, concept that covers uh, all of these things. And then the third step in this process of, of filling the yield gap is how do we then take those products uh, and start to generate income from them. And of course, uh, the traditional markets look like, like this one, where you see a whole range of fruits, nuts, bark, all sorts of other things um, being traded uh, on the roadside or in small village markets. Um, and we need to get uh, a bit further down the line start to help them to do a bit of processing, value adding, uh, and, and, and uh, get a better price for those products. And if we've gone through the domestication process, then also these products will be coming out of that uh, and hopefully have greater uniformity uh, and greater quality in terms of um, the market needs. So we're trying to go, if you like, from traditional markets towards uh, new business. And I think if we apply those three steps, uh, we can see that we can start to make uh, quite a lot of progress. And just to go over that, that again, uh, the first step that is a rehabilitation one using nitrogen fixing, uh, things like improved fallows, evergreen agriculture, etc., to get some higher yields and start the process towards food security. Use the domestication to improve the tree products, to further diversify the farming system, generate income and because the, many of these tree products are nutritious also start to improve um, nutrition and health all of which ends up with greater food security uh, and domestic self-sufficiency and that's where agroforestry has often gone and not much further so the real difference between what I'm talking about now and, and what's happened in, in agroforestry in the past is to add on this domestication and commercialization step. And it's really, I think, through the commercialization of these tree products that we see the opportunity for product processing, value adding, market chain development, and all of that then going on to employment, entrepreneurism, and trade, and consequently coming out as more income, empowerment of communities, gender equity, the use of that money in things like education and health, uh, and also using that money in terms of improved uh, farm infrastructure. So what we end up seeing out of this, I think, is that, oh, I should have said, this is also a highly adaptable generic model because we have thousands of, of tree species uh, around the world that can be put through this kind of process. So you, you can choose species that, that meet the, the uh, biophysical needs of any site, uh, ecological needs of a site, uh, and also perhaps the socioeconomic situation uh, in any given site. So it's a highly adaptable generic model, but what we see coming out of that um, is that we can get more than just closing the yield gap, we can start to see uh, we can make these further uh, benefits. So coming back to this diagram, I think we can see that we need to, to resolve this issue we need to start addressing simultaneously um, different parts uh, of, this, uh, of this cycle. And the yield gap has been um, identified as being 
the result of poverty driving land degradation and land degradation driving poverty. That's obviously a very simplified concept, uh, as we saw from our uh, diagram, earlier diagram. But if we're going to re really reverse this cycle of land degradation and social deprivation, we've got to get away from this and move towards uh, land rehabilitation uh, and enhanced livelihoods. So we can reverse this spiral uh, and start going uh, back up. Um, um, so what we're seeing then as we come back to this diagram is that we we're recognizing that low yield is, is the big thing we're trying to solve. We're recognizing that that's due to poor crop husbandry and, and to poverty and the need to fill this yield gap. But rather than doing further breeding of those crops, and rather than pouring on a fertilizer, we can see a need for a focus on natural resource rehabilitation, how to build soil fertility, uh, and how to build agroecological function through diversification. And so the first step here is to use our biological nitrogen fixing to improve the, the soil, uh, and also to start the diversification process. The second step then is to uh, grow these trees producing agroforestry tree products. Uh, so that's our name for non-timber forest products when they come from farming systems rather than from forest. Uh, perhaps also get benefits from um, payments for environmental services or rewards from environmental services. Anyway, generating income and using that income to improve uh, livelihoods as, as step two. And then step three, through the commercialization of the products, is to further improve income, see that you can use some of that income to address the need for agrochemicals, that then reducing livelihoods uh, perhaps a bit more, and getting back and satisfying your desire for security and wealth. So the three steps, I think, are filling uh, the yield gap, as we said earlier, but also helping to address this whole complex uh, cycle. Okay, so having said that, I want to change gear now and look at the potential of trees as new crops uh, and, and their role in business. How can we improve the products uh, so that they meet the needs of new businesses, uh, particularly to meet the need for better quality, uniformity, uh, and regular supply. And to answer that question, I think we need to know a little bit more about the genetic potential of trees. And one of the things that I find people find make, makes understanding this easier is to recognize that trees are in fact just like people. In trees, we have races, tribes, families, and individuals. We would normally call the provenances, uh, and then progenies and families, uh, and the, the tree to tree variation that you see between individuals. But within any population, whether it's people uh, or trees, uh, we have some individuals that are perhaps superior in one way or another, uh, and there are all sorts of different ways in which both people and, in, and trees can be superior than others. Uh, we can capture that kind of variation through domestication, uh, and in the case of trees, create new, new crops to meet new market opportunities. So in people, we're familiar with this concept. It's our, basically our celebrity culture. We're used to identifying people as Oscar winners or Nobel Prize winners, beauty queens uh, or sporting heroes. And we're really just doing the same thing now uh, for trees. But how do we do that? Well, this is an example for um, bush mango. Um, basically, if you collect the fruits from an individual tree, and measure all sorts of things, measure almost anything you, can, you care to think about to be able to characterize that tree-to-tree -tree variation. What you find is you get huge volumes of data. Um, and what I want you to look at here is the down every axis, whatever the trait is we're looking at, down every axis you see a lot of tree-to-tree -tree variation. Each color here. Each line here represents a different individual tree. 
But the other thing you can see is that there are all sorts of crossovers. So a big fruit doesn't necessarily produce a tasty fruit, and a tasty fruit doesn't necessarily have a big nut, and a big nut doesn't necessarily have good oil quality or, or whatever. So if we're going to progress with multi-trait selection, then we need to find some way of, of getting our, our head around that. But first of all, let's just look at what we're seeing down the spoke of each of that wheel. In anything we care to measure, you find this kind of tree-to-tree -tree variation, whether it's fruit morphology, whether it's the medicinal properties of the kernel oil, uh, the essential oils out of the heartwood of sandalwood, uh, or the edible oils coming out of, of nuts of, of, of Alan Blackwood. We find this continuous variation from, from the worst trees to the best trees, and that means we have potential to select those elite individuals uh, and develop them as cultivars to meet that particular trait. From there, we then need to go on, oh sorry, before we get to that, uh, we also want to just recognize the nutritional benefits of some of these uh, indigenous fruits and nuts. So here we see in the red numbers, uh, the, some values, mean values for these two uh, West African uh, fruit trees against mean values in blue here for uh, some standard staple food crops. And you can see these values are much higher and the micronutrients are also uh, much higher. The nutritional quality also, when we look at it in this kind of way, uh, tends to vary from, from tree to tree, but so too do the um, uh, anti-nutrients, so things that make nutrients more difficult to absorb. So it isn't as simple as just selecting uh, high, high nutrient content. Uh, we also have to select low anti-nutrient content. But there's very little data of this sort. Almost all the data you find in the scientific literature about nutrient content of these sorts of species is a mean value. And, and uh, quite honestly, the mean value when we're looking at this sort of variation uh, is not really terribly useful. It's the, it's the range of variation that's a much more useful piece of information. So, in addition to the sorts of things you can measure, uh, we also find that the market recognizes the trees from the fruits from different trees as well in, 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 in ways that aren't just due to shape, size, and color. So here you see three fruits uh, of Dacio Zedulis selling for 250 Central African francs, and down here, uh, 22 fruits selling for only a fifth of the price, 50 uh, CFA. And we've, we've been able to demonstrate that this uh, difference is very often due to uh, variation in, in taste. So not only fruit shape and size, uh, but also taste. So when we start to put all that together, to try and come up with a multi-trait uh, way of, of developing our cultivars, then in a species, some species of course can produce edible fruits, and those edible fruits also contain edible kernels. So we could see we could be developing two different sets of cultivars, even in a single species. Here, where we're interested in the fruit idiotype, the ideal fruit, we obviously want a, a big juicy fruit with lots of flesh, uh, and it's be tasty and nutritious. And if we're looking for more interested in the, in the nuts, the nut indiotype type would have a much larger nut, uh, perhaps a thin shell to make it easily extracted, and again, good qualities and con content uh, of the oils or whatever in the nut that we're interested in. So the, the concept, concept then of identifying which set of traits come together to meet a particular market opportunity. Um, so when we do that, then we can identify the individual tree which has the fruits that, that we think is important. We can either use grafting or marcotting to capture that genetic variation, and we can capture that genetic variation high in the crown of the tree so that we end up with material which is mature on its own roots, and so will give us fruiting and at an early age when the tree is still small, we can see fruit here. Uh, we can use uh, simple low-tech um, rooting of cuttings 
uh, in these uh, polypropagators, which don't require running water, don't require electricity, a highly efficient um, method of routing cuttings that is appropriate for remote communities, and do that then to develop uh, the cultivar, which of course is the genetic copy uh, of the mother tree that we selected. And so that's that standard uh, horticultural techniques that have been around for thousands of years. And this is this concept that you can uh, capture the mature part of the tree and bring that down to ground level and shorten the time to fruiting uh, and also make it, of course, easier uh, to harvest those fruits. So by just by choosing whereabouts in the tree you propagate, you can, so to speak, design your, uh, your appropriate cultivar to meet whatever needs you might have. Now, I want just to try and get across to you what I think is the power of domestication. Let's just look at the domestication of the wolf. These are all, well, not all, these are some of the breeds of dog that have been bred from the wolf. So there in the wolf genome, we had all this variation, uh, which breeders over long periods of time have teased out uh, to give us this wide range uh, of, of dog breeds. And we can do, I think, exactly the same thing for any, any tree species. So we've got, I said we've got thousands of tree species to play with. For any one of those tree species, I think we can tease out the variation in much the same sort of way. We can do it much more rapidly because we can use vegetative techniques, uh, which we couldn't, of course, do uh, or until recently anyway, uh, in dogs. So the opportunity is there for a very wide range of tree species to start to identify particular traits that meet particular market or industrial uh, prospects and uses uh, and, and develop those cultivars uh, to meet those markets. And when you look at the sorts of products that are found in trees, whether it's from the stem of the tree, the leaf, the flowers, or the fruits, uh, you can see that there's a whole range of different kinds of products which we can start off by trying to match to particular genetic traits. We can then recognize also that in individual species, we can also I, I find lots of different uses for different parts of the same tree. So in Garcinia cola, for example, the fruit can be used as a purgative to expel worms. The nuts can be used as a stimulant and also to treat various um, health problems. The, the twigs uh, can be used as toothbrush and toothpaste because they have bactericidal properties. The bark can be used for tanning leather and also for medicinal purposes, as, as indeed can the, uh, some of the uh, exudates. So just in one species, we could, could be developing a number of different cultivars to meet uh, different market opportunities. And when we expand that over the ranges of trees we have available to us, I think you can see that there's huge opportunities. And we can go through various levels of the hierarchy of these idiotypes that we were talking about, try and break them down further and further uh, to identify the, the traits which meet um, particular market needs. Okay, so that all sounds, perhaps it sounds okay in theory, how do you do it uh, in practice? So um, while I was uh, with ICRA, uh, we set up um, a, a participatory domestication program uh, here in, in Cameroon. Uh, it started off with um, about 10 farmers in each of two villages uh, and it's now grown to be um, about 10,000 farmers in just over 500 villages over the period of about 12 years. Um, and I think the reason that it's been so successful has been that it is, A, we started out by saying, what do you want? And they told us this was what they wanted and they understood how to get there. Uh, and so they were keen and enthusiastic to adopt it. Uh, secondly, I think it meets the, the local market opportunities uh, and it also fits nicely uh, with some of their uh, traditions and culture. So those are all reasons why uh, there's been good farmer-to-farmer -farmer exchange and dissemination of techniques and concepts and strategies 
uh, and the thing has, has snowballed uh, fairly well. So we now have something like 50 tree species going through this kind of process of domestication. I've marked two of them here um, for the species that have already been approved by EU regulations. Uh, this is the Alan Black here, which is being developed by, uh, with the help of Unilevers as an alternative uh, to margarine. So I think what we're seeing coming out of this then is a new wave of domestication. And if you read Jared Diamond's book, uh, he's, well, he's done two books, uh, one's Collapse and the other's Guns, Germs and Steel. They both have the same sort of message in it, but he says in this one that domestication has been the precursor of settled, politically centralized, socially stratified, economically complex and technologically innovative societies. And he's talking, of course, mainly about the impact uh, that's happened over thousands of years uh, in the industrialized countries from the one or two waves of, of, of domestication that have already happened, depending on, on how, how you number them. But what I think we're starting to see now is a new wave of domestication specifically focused uh, on the needs of people in the less well-off countries of the world, and particularly in the tropics and subtropics. And hopefully uh, we can persuade uh, donors and, and the development organizations to recognize the need and, and the potential of a new wave of domestication, particularly targeting uh, the tropics. Just to give you some feel for how far that's got so far, we've had two decades of this kind of work. Uh, we've got the publications that came out in the first decade marked in blue, the second decade marked in yellow. And so this is the range of different, 16 different research topics, and you can see uh, they are increasing over the decades. And this is the geographic spread. It started most with a West African focus and has now become uh, a pretty much a, a global program. So, from that kind of domestication, how do we then go through with the commercialization? And how do we actually get that operating uh, in practice? And what we're starting to see, in, again in Cameroon, from the same program, where the um, uh, rural resource centers are not only teaching techniques of nursery management and domestication and the use of um, microfinance, but also trying to help the local people in local towns to develop fairly simple drying ovens, nut crackers, etc. How to package the dry and package the products, how to extract oil. Simple techniques that are being developed in the local, rural, uh, local urban communities to help uh, the processing and in fact also to create uh, job opportunities and, uh, and uh, new business opportunities uh, locally. And so we're starting to see a number of cottage industries appearing <coughs> in, relation, in association with the agroforestry project in this whole area of how to do the, the value adding and processing. And again, mostly rather low tech techniques, but certainly uh, making the first inroads uh, into better opportunities. Trade. And so if we come back to this diagram and the idea of transferring from traditional markets to new business, if you are out there looking in, in, in the uh, more developed markets of, of developing countries, you often start to find a whole range of products coming out as bottled products or packaged in some way. And so I think we are starting to see that the commercialization of many of these products is, is actually moving forward quite fast probably faster than the domestication at the moment, uh, and that domestication and commercialization really have to run in parallel if they're to be successful. But the, in terms of the commerce, the, the importance of the domestication uh, increases with, the, with sequential steps up the value chain. So as you go from global to local to global, so the need for uniformity, quality, and reliability uh, increases but in leaps and bounds. The European market, for example, has, has very high standards that you have to meet to be able to, to sell any of these things uh, in, in the EU. But a number of these kinds of, of products are popping up around the world 
Uh, this one is now found in most um, supermarkets. The Alan Black deal that I mentioned runs a price is being uh, developed by Unilever in association with ICRA, and more importantly still being involved as a public-private partnership with local communities so that they will be the long-term beneficiaries uh, of the domestication of this new oil crop to Africa. Unilever have said they're not going to make the mistake they made uh, with oil palm, which they let it go global. They're going to keep uh, Alan Rakia as a genetic resource for Africa uh, and develop it as uh, an African crop. Their interest in it is this very high level of oleic and, and stearic acids, which apparently make, I'm not a chemist, but apparently makes making margarine very much more easy. You don't have so many products you have to get rid of in the processing, uh, and it's uh, also solid um, at room temperature. So, maybe money really could grow on trees, and we really could use this sort of approach uh, to improve and raise poor farmers uh, out of the poverty and into the cash economy. But of course, there are um, some big worries and issues that would go in parallel with that. And perhaps the biggest of those is how do we protect uh, poor farmers who are making these sorts of innovations? The intellectual property rights uh, of the industrial world really don't apply to developing of, of crop varieties by poor communities because of the cost of registering a, uh, a plant breeding right, for example. Uh, so we, we have to f hope that the sorts of negotiations which are going on, I think in WIPO this very week, will start to make uh, progress towards finding ways of protecting the innovations uh, of farmers and local communities, both when they develop these cultivars but also as they go into business relationships um, selling uh, these kinds of, of products. That, the latter part, the commercialization side, has made considerable progress in the last few years. It's more the uh, registration of plant breed, equivalent of plant breeders' rights, which is, is the big um, deficiency at the moment. So, what I've been trying to get across is that we can perhaps take uh, tropical and subtropical agriculture into this multifunctional concept. We can see ways of, of, of filling the yield gap. We can see ways that that can start to have uh, big impacts on, on food security and go on then also to address uh, some of the issues of, of, of poverty and malnutrition. And doing that through what ICRAF is calling its rural resource centres, uh, which is set up without not to put money into these communities, but it's, it's basically uh, only providing skills, techniques, and knowledge uh, into the communities, both in terms of the, of the um, nursery management, of the domestication, the setting up of agroforestry systems, uh, and then helping people to use that money, whether it's for uh, putting in, in uh, water pumps, piped water supplies, wells, or helping them to develop methods of processing some of this, these products or helping them in, in trade. All of these things are being uh, taught to communities uh, through these rural resource centers, and they themselves are then uh, expanding that and disseminating that information so that any one rural resource center currently has up to 30 or 40 satellite village nurseries uh, coming under its general um, aegis, but starting to see how we can take this, this approach to um, dissemination of knowledge out uh, and see how we can scale it up uh, to the sorts of numbers that I talked about earlier. And it is, I think, it's, I see it now, that the big issue is the scaling up. How do we convince donors of the need uh, for this kind of approach? Uh, that obviously goes back to understanding adoption processes and impact and that's something that agroforestry has not been very good at. But how do we also uh, scale up this kind of model? Uh, we were talking a bit about this earlier this morning. Um, it seems to me that's really where the, the challenge 
now lies, because we do know something about how to have these kinds of impacts on poverty. This is the amount of income being generated from rural resource centres over two, five, ten years. A substantial jumps in income of this community, well above um, the Millennium Development Goal uh, targets, mainly in the early years through the sale of, of, of plants to their neighbours and to other people, but then as the years go by, also selling um, the products. And then how do we in initiate those and establish those within complex agroforestry systems in ways that then have benefits for carbon sequestration, have benefits for wildlife through the development of these kinds of multifunctional landscape. How do we help to get better education, the money used from some of these products, into the schools, uh, into uh, supporting business, help supporting women uh, in their activities of processing, for example, uh, and in, in marketing and trade. And one of the issues which keeps getting raised by um, the communities is that one of the reasons they're really interested in the income from some of these tree crops is that the income, in this case from the red data here, from, um, bush, uh, from um, Satu, Dacuri edginus, comes at a time of the year when it meets the spike uh, in the need for, to meet the uh, costs of schooling and school uniforms. So the women are particularly interested in, in, in trading this tree in order to meet uh, this education demand. Okay, so if we come back to this diagram, what I, I think we're starting to see is that we can take it and use it to improve um, food security, and we can then go to the next step and perhaps take it to, to what is now being called sustainable intensification, where we're starting to really meet the Millennium Development Goals, and seeing that by solving the yield gap, we're also getting a multiplicity uh, of other benefits, all these sorts of things here in these uh, pink boxes. So these kinds of landscapes, uh, where we're looking at agroforestry as an applied approach to uh, ecology, where we're seeing that by integrating trees into the farming system, we're moving from the, the uh, pioneer stage of the, of the crop into more mature uh, agroecosystems, and doing that in ways that have uh, all of these different benefits that we've mentioned um, several times. And that, I think, is where this kind of approach takes us towards uh, sustainable intensification. And so, when it comes to impacts, uh, as I said, really, there have not been any good impact studies done yet, and that's a major problem and a major requirement. But certainly the people in these villages are currently saying things like uh, they're using the money to buy fertilizers or dig a well, uh, their family are eating more healthily, they're processing and trading and making more money, uh, eating more fruits and vegetables. But the one which really, I think, I think we really most encouraging is that some of the young people in these villages are starting to say, well, we now don't need to go to town and, and look for work. We can see that we can develop our, our careers and our businesses in our own villages. I think if we can get that as a result of this kind of approach, then we really will be making uh, important progress. Uh, and so I think this kind of multifunctional approach to agriculture does seem to be transforming people's lives albeit on, on a very small scale. How do we scale it up? How do we develop that as an integrated rural development program make more efficient uh, use uh, of development dollars? And that's what I'm currently engaged in with uh, this charity registered in the UK where we're trying to help people to set up uh, tree nurseries and, and put what, the sorts of things I've been talking about uh, into practice. That is more or less it, except to say that if you want to know any more <laughs> about any of that, uh, you should find it uh, in this book.
Professor Abidu for that um, lecture. Um, we saw them some concepts philosophical about property and different aspects that we are now facing with the challenges and how these three steps can be practically addressed that. Um, so we're opening this uh, session for questions and Professor Abidu will be answering that. Um, you have <laughs> um, 30 minutes to do that, or yeah, so we're opening some questions now. Um, first of all, thank you for the presentation, it was really interesting. Um, when you mentioned commercialization, I feel um, talk about two sort of contrasting views one that is um, regional local markets um, addressing the needs of um, traditional um, tradi the traditional society and then the more international global aspect and public private partnerships mm -hmm. um, together with the problems those yeah. might yeah. bring up um, if you compare the two how strong do you feel that at this point in time there is the need to go global and to go um, to, to scale up, like would it be possible to stay um, concentrated on the regional markets first? No, that's, that's a very good question and uh, originally we thought um, that we would only focus really on the local and regional mm. um, because that's where we see there's a huge need uh, and where perhaps we can have the greatest impact. Uh, and so we didn't pick up in those early days things like the Alan Brackett program uh, well, we didn't even know that people like you didn't even might be interested. Um, so our original concept was to really focus on local and regional. Um, and in doing that, to see that when once these farmers get the skills to be able to do that for one or two species, they can actually do it to a much wider range. And that's what we see happening in the communities once they've learned how to develop cultivars of one species, they go off and they do it on a whole lot of others. So there's real opportunities to uh, see that the market is going to diversify locally, so that the local economy is going to be enriched by that kind of diversification. So that was the original intention. Um, when someone like Unilever came in and said, well, we want to develop this as an international crop, but we're actually prepared to do it in the way you describe doing it with the communities, for the communities, by the communities, then it seems silly to say, well, we don't want, don't right. want your help. <laughs> because obviously, in the longer term, those are the sorts of guys who do have the money, who could perhaps scale some of this up. Mm. But it comes, as you say, with risks. Uh, and at the moment, um, Unilever are being very responsible about the approach. They're saying, yes, we're going to do this as a crop for Africa, we're going to do it um, at, at, the, at the local level with communities and all the, ben all the benefits and they don't at this stage seem to be those risks uh, and disbenefits. But um, you know, policies obviously change in big business and it, so we have to be a little bit careful but hopefully um, they will stick to that. The one or two other examples of these kinds of public-private partnerships uh, you may have seen a picture of a Mercedes-Benz car in one of those slides. Uh, they, way back in the, now um, nearly 15 years ago, started to develop alternatives to fiberglass using products produced on ag in agricultural systems in Brazil. And in, in exchange for the raw materials that they brought into their factories, they provided uh, the villagers with clean water, health and education. So if you can get big business to come in and see their social responsibilities in those kinds of ways, then I think it, it does mean that there are opportunities to see them as good guys and not just bad guys. <laughs> so, it, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a lot sort of hanging in the wind at the moment, but if this can be steered in the right kind of direction, then hopefully the international markets um, are not an impossibility. Having said that, uh, most, of these, most of these species probably don't have international markets. So we, you know, we probably aren't going that way for most of them anyway. Although um, when I was working in Australia, only one indigenous plant in Australia has ever been domesticated. Macadamia nut. Uh, and there are huge, I don't know how much you know about bush tucker, 
But the indigenous peoples talk about bush tucker and they have a huge range of species that are important. And most white Australians say yuck is disgusting. But then, so would you say they're yuck and disgusting if you looked at a poker bean or a coffee bean? And no one's really looked to see what possibilities there might be for the processing. So, you know, it's many of those Australian species and many of these species with roasting or, or uh, um, what's the word? Um, fermentation. 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 <laughs> might lead some of these kinds of products to also have, have new markets. Um, so, you know, we just don't know an awful lot. Um, but I guess my message is that the possibilities, probability and potential out there uh, that we can do and, and we shouldn't slap people on the wrists at this stage and say we don't want your help if they're prepared to do it, do it in what seem like uh, socially responsible ways. How far would your agroforestry uh, project be eligible for carbon credits? Um, yeah, highly so. Uh, uh, ICRAF is um, seriously engaged in the whole Red Plus process. Um, I haven't personally got involved in that, but we did have the payment for environmental services was one of the options uh, on one of those graphs. Um, so yes, that is a potential source of income. I guess my big worry about that is just how do you make sure that money gets to the community. Um, money has a funny way of disappearing. <laughs> uh, so I would certainly be worried about it if it was going through ministries. Uh, maybe it can go through NGOs and those sorts of organisations and, and it can really get that, those carbon payments can actually get to the communities. But that is... It would be eligible? Yes. And, you know, do you have any examples of such contracts? Um, I don't know it is or my head, but on certain, voluntary base? No, or there, there certainly are examples. I, I'm afraid I just aren't, I'm not adequately aware of them, but there are examples. Of